that's probably <laughs> it. Did we have, so this is from version one, right? Did we have the restarts? And I don't remember that. No. Okay. There was just like a little blurb about it at, in the chapter, like restarts is outside of the scope of the chapter, but it'll probably be in version three of Advanced Star. So we got a little extra there. Yeah, that was interesting. I can think of a couple places where that would be used, but I've never used it before. I've always found it easier to just use try and use an if statement. If like the class is try error, then do something else like in succession, which is probably not the typical way people do it, but it's always worked. Can you or can anybody speak to the try versus try catch? She um, mentioned in the video, I think that to use try over try catch or was it the other way around? I think she said the other way. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it says in the book the other way around. Yeah, try catch is lower level than try. Try is like a wrapper. Mm -hmm. Try catch is my understanding. Um, but I don't know. I don't typically use try catch because... I can't always think of a special treatment that I want to give mm -hmm. to an error. I just want to know that the error happened so I can like try something else. Um, and the, the like syntax makes it such that like if you have, if you need, say you need to try two, two new things, like she had to do that really complicated nested structure with like try catch inside of with restarts inside of with restarts. And so you're kind of like forced into doing that like very nested structure. Whereas if with try, you can just go like try this thing and it returns something. And if it errors, it's gonna return an error, just like a try error class. And it's gonna give you an error message. And then you can do like if that failed, then try this with try again. And then like, if that failed, try this with try again. And to me, that just seemed easier to do, but like, I'm interested to try the with restarts um, to see if it works, but try catch is, try catch is just confusing to me. Has anybody used it before? No. I find it, I found it super useful in like web scraping where you want to do a reproducible web scraping engine because websites frequently change mm. by small amounts, like data changes on it or they'll change a class or an, like a, you know, an ID or something. And so some part of a reproducible like web scraping thing might fail and you want it to be able to accommodate multiple cases of what the scraper might find on the website. And so that's when I found it really useful is to use like try, I've used try like multiple times. To just like, okay, if, if you didn't find this, then look for this item. Mm -hmm. And if that's not found then look for this item because of the way um, websites, you know, different pages will load differently based on what the back back end engine is using. Um, so that's where I found it useful. Yeah, has anyone else used any of this before? Because for me, I'm not building functions a lot and I'm not like web scraping. I'm mostly processing and doing analysis and visualizations in R. So all of this was like, Oh no, what have I gotten myself into? <laughs> Many years ago, trying to work on some other thing, but some other language in which I needed to catch errors, um, but never in R. And I, like you, Emily, I'm just doing analysis of very specific data, which I know pretty much the same. 
um, the part where she talked, uh, Maya Gans talked about the expensive function that you don't want to interrupt would have been really good when I was working on my thesis. Didn't happen, never knew about it. So, but yeah, I haven't. I yeah, I like that part as well. Uh, the trying to recover when after running something very expensive, computationally speaking, because it's painful. Like I've been working on that, like some large files, uh, they, there's no other way than just do something sequential. I've been trying to do parallel stuff, but it doesn't really apply because then you need some results, uh, previous results to carry on. But then you realize after 20 minutes that it fail. So it's, it's really painful. And I was going to say that for try catch, I have used those. Um, right now, I was working with some files that they're called NetCDF. It's uh, usually uh, like weather uh, variables like kind of variables. And the thing is, the case is that sometimes they call longitude as L-O-N, like long, but some other people call it like as a full word, longitude. But then I don't really know which is going to be available. And I could just try to match the names before trying to read, but then I just was too lazy and just did try catch. So try to read long, if long doesn't exist, like throws an error, then try to read longitude. And if that doesn't happen, then stop <laughs> and put a silly message to the user. Like, you it's know what you're doing. It's for reproducibility. It's not because you're lazy. It's more reproducible <laughs> that way. I guess. Yeah, I've written a lot of functions for models and I, they are probably horrible looking at all this stuff. <laughs> like my um like for bayesian models then you have like an update function for each parameter and they're all nested and we you know my um professor she was like yeah you just put a print statement in like one of the functions so that you know it like got to there and so <laughs> yeah i do mostly data analysis as well so this was you know above my head a little bit um but as I was thinking about it, what I was thinking is sort of the idea that if you're creating something that somebody else is going to use, you know, like the lawn versus longitude, like, you know, you knew that you could have checked both, but like, if you're going to create even just a model or a function that someone else might use, who knows what they're going to put into it. That's, that's sort of how I was reading what she was saying was just that like, you know, check to make sure you're not taking the log of a negative number. So um, one of the things I've had to do recently is um, start using um, warnings I've never had to use them before because I come from neuroscience background. So it's just been like data analysis like the rest of you guys. But um, what I have to do now is loop over like things like several data frames. So in order to do that, what I've been doing is creating like summary tables instead. And then I use um, something called a cert R on top of that. And then, you, but if I, use it if I'm looking at the individual data frame I just use like see a bot instead in the message and that's about as far as it goes so when it comes to like these complex handlers I've not really had to use those and this you know starting to think about this is really quite sophisticated because it's just so many like levels above what I'm used to with the capturing loads and loads of uh, different messages or trying to work out which ones are bubbling up into which position and that's what I think I personally find quite complex about this all. Yeah, that bubbling up was confusing and I still don't know. I don't understand the order that things are printed. Steven, I think it was you answered in the chat about that that's just the way it is. That's the answer. That was the answer to the question about the printing. But do you know why? Um, well, the bubbling up is, is different from the try catch finally. Um, the question was about the finally, like when finally executes with try catch. Um, and in the why would it do it first? What's the logic there? It's me. 
Um, I think it's like, I don't know, you can alter something on the, like on the top level if you want to, because finally executes in the environment in which try catch was called. It doesn't execute in the environment that you executed the expression that you passed to try catch. So if you wanted to like do something before like throwing the error or, or the warning or whatnot, you could do that. So like the example it gave is like if you have if you have linked a file connection or like a database connection and you want to disconnect that before you return from the function so the connection doesn't stay open and you know possibly get corrupted or something, uh, you can use finally to like disconnect the file connection or the database before it actually returns the error to the user. Um, the bubbling up though was, that was about the like with calling handlers and it had like a message inside the expression. And then it had a with calling handler with a message saying another message as the calling handler. And then a with calling handler at the top level that returns, that also has a message when there's a message. And so it like goes down into the expression, it executes that, and then it goes up one level, which is gonna execute a message. So it ends up going to the top level and executing that, and then back down to the middle level, and then that executes the top level again. So at least that's how I understood the, the way it was doing, because it caught, caught the condition, then caught the condition, fired the message, that message was caught again and then fired the top level message again. So that was like the bubbling up um, example that they had, which I don't know how practical that is. Did you find these um, examples a bit too impractical as well? Like um, what I found particularly difficult here is like, she says at the beginning of the talk that the examples are like, very strong examples but they're not really like based in you know how you actually tend to work in R so you know when you work with a database is or like a load of data then you'd want to be able to link that up with the example but because obviously a book has limited space it's almost like he's reduced it down as much as possible but that makes it quite difficult to understand I find yeah it's like all the examples in the base R documentation you're just like what the heck is that? Like, nobody is ever going to use that. Yeah, that's exactly my feelings too. Um, luckily, though, she's given us a load of code on her slides, which is great. Um, I do have one question, though. In my browser, when I see her slides, um, they're like oversized and don't quite fit on the page. Does anyone else find that? Is there a way around it? Her slides are not oversized uh, for me, but I'm, I'm not sure why. I think that you're clicking on the GitHub slides and that's why they are oversized. I tried reducing it, couldn't. I guess if you download the thing, download the, the, the markdown file to your computer and launch it, then it might be working. But checking on that also shows up oversized and Windows 10. So maybe that has to do something with it. I can't uh, give that go, thanks. Um, I was thinking another place where like try and try catch and calling handlers is used frequently is shiny applications because they're inherently for other users to be able to input stuff and it's frequent. Like there's a high probability that they're gonna put something in there or try to do something that is atypical. And so that's a place where try catch and is used a lot because oftentimes, you know, if a user who doesn't know R and is just using a top level shiny app, it gets an error message that R surfaces from like just the default for whatever that function was, they're gonna have they're gonna be clueless as to like what to do with it. And so try catch is really useful for giving meaningful errors 
uh, to people who like have no no uh, understanding of R, like in a shiny when you're using a shiny creating a shiny app. There's some really interesting examples of that bubbling up on the companion cohort one companion. Oh yeah. If, you, if we want to talk about that some more. Oh, I guess we only have three minutes. I'll just put it in here. I have another broad question for the group. Um, has anyone, they, she talks a little bit about unit testing. I've never done, like created a unit test for a package, but I'm imagining it might be difficult to create a un, unit test, for instance, for a shiny document that's fully comprehensive, if that makes sense. Like that might, it might be hard to catch every error or is it, is it more just trying to make sure that a, a test case can run through and then the user's on their own after that? Um, most of the unit testing is on ensuring that your internal functions take the out the input that they're supposed to get and that they warn an error and produce what they're supposed to output um, such that when people like contribute uh, they don't break your functions. You'll know mm -hmm. like if the function gets broken. Um, but I know there's a package called shiny test. I have not used it, but it's supposed to be made for testing shiny apps. Um, I haven't used it though. Like I, the only experience I've had with that is the Gollum package has like a, a very basic shiny test that it uh, as a unit test, it like make sure the app starts. So it basically make sure that like nothing gets in the way of the startup process and it runs the app. And if it runs for 10 seconds without erroring, then it's a, then it's a successful test. Um, but I know that there are, they're actively developing a package for testing shiny applications, but that is like, mad complicated because you have to you know run it run it in a browser and be able to see what outputs are happening in the browser and then bring that back into typical test that did anybody else have any burning thoughts for our last minute together Nothing like super important, but I didn't know if you guys noticed my warnings didn't actually say warning, have that label. Um, I don't know what. <laughs> Do you mean when you run the code locally that was in the PowerPoint? Like just going through the book, like the first R condition, or sorry, the first. Um, our example, I mean, it says the warning function, it will be labeled warning colon, just like error. Mine is not, it just looks like a message. I don't know if it's cause I'm on like 4.0.3, I don't know. Could be, is anybody, is anybody else using 4.03? I'm not. Yeah, I mean, some of the examples like that one I posted, the second one I posted, like my R, the version I'm using, that example returns the exact same thing for both with calling handlers and try catch. So I don't know what Hadley was talking about there. It's not reproducible in, on my computer. Did anybody else? have a different result from that that one it was like the last exercise section number two i think it was like a uh, warning to error and it was asking the difference between using with calling handlers and try catch and it said like look at trace back
I don't think I ran any of the last examples. <laughs> or exercises. I guess somebody did. Yeah, that was that was confusing. I couldn't reproduce that example. It made no sense to me. The examples like you read and you're like, oh, I think that that would be easy. And then like as soon as I try to start doing, I'm like, oh. <laughs> okay. Well, we are also officially at time. I I just want to acknowledge that so that no one feels like they need to stay on. But I mean, if you just feel like chatting with other people who like are, you're welcome to stay. <laughs> I got to get some food and go phone bank. So I'm going to say good night. Good luck. Thanks. Thanks for <laughs> playing the movie. And thanks, everybody, for coming. See you all next week. Wait, do we have somebody for next week? Yes, Camilla. <laughs> I'll type functions. Yeah. Cool. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you all. Yep. I'll try to come back and please. Do. Stay yeah. Well. Thanks, thanks for, for joining us. Thank you. Bye. 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 Good night. Good night. <sighs> Bye, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Bye.